All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Josiah Katanga. I am the Managing Director of California State PTA, and we are a partner organization uh, presenting this event today. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, there's so many other things you could be doing at this time of the evening, uh, so we, we honor you for your time. Uh, before we begin, uh, we need to provide instructions for translation service. Uh, simultaneous interpretation is being provided in Spanish. Um, everyone does have to pick a language, so please click the globe at the bottom of your screen and uh, pick a preferred language. If you do choose Spanish, make sure to mute the original audio. Heidi, I will let you um, interpret that. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Josiah Quintonga y soy el director de manejo del de PTA del estado de California. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí y por tomar esta tarde para estar en esta presentación. Vamos a dar información sobre cómo acceder al canal eh, para interpretación en español. Estaremos ofreciendo interpretación simultánea. Le pedimos que por favor vea en la pantalla las instrucciones al igual que siga los siguientes pasos. Si nos acompaña por una computadora, apriete el símbolo del de globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Eh, seleccione el inglés, el, perdón, el español, el idioma que desea escuchar, en este caso español, y ponga en mudo o apague el audio original para solamente escuchar la voz del intérprete. Si está acompañándonos por un teléfono inteligente, a través de teléfono inteligente o una tableta, busque los tres puntos eh, que usualmente se encuentran en la palabra que dice más o more y elija la, el idioma en la, en la interpretación. Y en esta parte necesita presionar la tecla done o finalizado para poder dar acción a la interpretación. Si tiene algún a problema técnico, por favor, díganos en el chat en español y podremos asistirle. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, we're eager to share a lot of information with you today about the Arts and Music in Schools Act and give you some resources that we've created to help you understand the material a bit better. Um, let me share the agenda real quick on some of the things that we're going to cover today. Um, first, we're going to provide an overview of what the new law is. What is Prop 28? Uh, we're going to share what it means to be an advocate in this particular moment. Um, we will review some new advocacy resources that we've created specifically uh, for the successful implementation of the Arts and Music Schools, um, Music in Schools Act. Uh, we will have a call to action that we will complete together today. And then finally, we will wrap it up with some question and answers. Um, some of you sent in some questions, thank you. And we will be trying to answer as many questions that uh, as, as many as we can in the chat. So without any further ado, um, it is my pleasure to introduce Tom DeCaney, Executive Director of Free California. Good evening, Tom, take it away. Thank you, Josiah, and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this Thursday evening. Um, I want to start by thanking all the partners who helped put today's webinar together and who are working to ensure Proposition 28 is implemented with equity in mind and fidelity as intended by the voters. Um, those partners are the California PTA, Arts for LA, Friends of Sacramento Arts, and the Arts Education Alliance of the Bay Area. So we appreciate them not just for this webinar, but for their ongoing partnership and advocacy for arts education across the state. Uh, it's such an exciting time for arts education in California. The passage of Proposition 28, the Arts and Music in Schools Act last November has created enormous potential for our state to expand arts education for all students. We need these funds to help make much needed, needed progress towards achieving equity in arts education. In September of 2022, SRI Education released a report entitled The Creativity Challenge that showed that only 11% of California schools meet the state mandated requirements for arts education. This number remained unchanged from the last SRI education study over a decade ago. Schools that provided the least arts education opportunities for students were one, elementary schools, two, court and community schools, and three, schools serving high proportions of students from low income families. Everyone here today has an essential role in helping make sure 
that we are engaged with school leaders to ensure that the new funds are used to expand current arts education programming, not supplant, and help deliver a high quality, culturally relevant arts education for all students in our state. We all wouldn't be here having this conversation today without the incredible vision and work of Austin Butner, the author of Proposition 28. Austin, Austin is not just the author, but also funded this measure out of his own pocket and is the former superintendent of LA Unified School District. Austin has recorded a message to share with us today since he couldn't be with us. Before we begin the recording, I just wanna thank all of you for your commitment to advocacy for arts education in our state and making sure that all students receive the education they need and deserve. So with that, Katya, why don't we go ahead and show the video? Thank you. Hi, I'm Austin Butner, the author of Prop 28. It's my pleasure to be with you all today. First, just to share in the celebration. This is something we've all been fighting for for a long, long time, to bring arts and music back to our public schools in the state of California. Before Prop 28, barely one in five public school students had a chance to participate in the arts at school. That's awful. Shouldn't be that way. We all know the arts are the glue that bring together a good education. They help give us all a sense of agency, a way to express ourselves. Uh, myself, my journey, I was a shy kid. Fifth grade, new elementary school, didn't know anybody. It was the middle of the school year. Fortunately for me, Music teacher asked me to join his class. They had lunch. I found someone to have lunch with. They found a sense of belonging, a group, uh, and a sense of agency. Over time, cello became bass, bass became guitar, and I could play in front of thousands of people before I could speak in front of tens of people. But for me, it all started with that safe place, that group of friends. Now, Prop 28, it's a new day in California, a bright new day. Two-thirds of the voters in the state of California spoke emphatically last November and said, we need arts and music back in our public schools. And thanks to you and Create California and the entire coalition of arts educators and advocates and the school community and everybody who came together, it's a new day. It'd be about a billion dollars coming to our public schools each and every year, now and forever, to make sure children have a chance to participate in arts and music at schools. So we've done the first part, but our job's not done. We've need to make sure the tools are in place so that schools make good choices. We've given agency to local communities. So each of the almost 10,000 schools in the state of California, that school community can decide the arts program that they want to bring to their community, that they want their children to participate in. Once the program's chosen, we have to help connect artists and educators with schools. Schools need to hire about 15,000 new arts educators. That's just a number. But well, let's put that in context. That's more arts educators that are in public schools today in the state of California. And that's more arts educators than will be hired in the rest of the country combined over the next year or two. So an enormous task to bring artists and help them become educators, help them become successful in schools. We'll need to make sure the tools and supports are there so someone who's got the content mastery, they can bring that master of the arts to schools. We need to make sure they become a great teacher that they're comfortable in the classroom uh, and that they're successful as an educator. And then as we look to the horizon, we're gonna bring a much more diverse and multicultural set of people to our schools uh, and with them all kinds of new programs and the future will be different and much, much brighter for students in California. And as those programs develop, organizations like yours, people like yourself will need to stay engaged to make sure that we help schools make the choices we help them find the talent they need to implement a program at their school. As these programs become more expansive, more diverse, more multicultural, and we're preparing students for a career, whether in the arts or just for life, uh, that they bring those talents back to California, back to our communities, to help themselves become advocates for the arts and live that world of the arts that we know connects us all. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been a dream of mine for a long, long time, and I think many of you as well. I'm delighted to have been part of this coalition, and I hope you'll stay with us in this coalition as we work to implement Prop 28 and begin to realize on the promise and the dream of making sure that every child in the state of California can participate in arts and music as part of their education. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you.
so much, Austin, for your vision and your tenacity in making this historic measure possible. My name is Allison Cagley. I'm founding executive director of Sa Friends of Sacramento Arts. Our vision is arts every day for every child in every school. I'm an Arts Now leader with Create California and a regional partner working together with these groups that are online tonight. I'd now like to introduce the video that we have about Prop 28. Take it away, Katya. Arts education in California has been underfunded and deprioritized for far too long. But the Arts and Music in Schools Funding Act, or Prop 28, is now law, and it guarantees funding for arts education PK through 12th grade. The funds are meant to supplement and expand existing arts education programming, not supplant or replace them. The money can go toward hiring teachers and staff, art supplies and materials, as well as teacher training and more. Using these funds to replace existing arts education funding or programs violates the law and should be reported immediately to Prop 28 at createca.org. Create California has resources to help schools and communities ensure the success of this exciting new law. Remember, the Ed Code promises that every school offers visual art, dance, music, and theater every day. Arts education is essential for the success of every student. For more information on implementing Prop 28, sign up for our newsletter at createca.org. As Austin mentioned, in um, November of 22, over 64% of California voters approved Proposition 28, the Arts and Music in Schools Act. Thanks to the grassroots efforts of Create California, parents, teachers, artists, and community members who worked hard to get, to get it not only on the ballot, but to have it approved. As it mentioned, the purpose of this fund is to supplement, to add to the daily instruction in TK-12 public schools. As indicated in the actual title of the bill, guaranteed funding and accountability is key to understanding how we must work together with our school principals, school districts, and teachers to ensure success, which will begin the process of fulfilling the California State Arts Education Framework requirements that were approved seven years ago. It is anticipated that the funds will be released to school districts in early spring of 2024. The estimated 800 million to 1 billion is from the state's general fund and is a permanent funding stream for public education. Schools have up to three years to use the annual allocation so it is not a lose it or use it or lose it type of funding. The requirement is it to expand whatever is being provided now or start new programs if nothing exists. For schools that have 500 or more students, 80% of that funding must be used for certified or classified employees. The remaining 20% is for supplies, materials, and partnerships with arts organizations for programs. For smaller schools, less than 500 students, they do not have that percentage allocation structure. Next slide. So each school can determine what arts education programs to add to their school year with this new funding source. As parents, volunteers, and community leaders, you have a role in creating open communication with your schools, staying informed, and working with your local school or district in identifying what arts programs will best serve your student population and what arts instruction is not currently being provided. You can help with assisting in creating the annual plan and the budget for a successful, comprehensive, and equitable arts education program while adhering to the requirements of the law. An annual report is required that documents the programs provided, the number of staff providing it, the number of schools, and the number of students who are benefiting from this fund. As mentioned in the video, the email address, prop28 at createca.org, is available for you to voice your comments, your concerns, your questions, and continue to learn and be involved with your school and district. And now I'm proud to introduce Create CA student voice leader, Penelope Oliver. Penelope is 17 and from Sacramento and is a community organizer, poet, 
writer, and activist. Welcome, Penelope. Thank you so much, Allison, and thank you all for being here to learn about arts education and how you can better advocate for Prop 28 in your communities. As a student, I see the effect art has on mental health. It makes us helps us make sense of this world. As a nonprofit leader for an organization that serves underserved kids, I see every time we're in the field how many kids are not getting arts education. There's so many times we come across kids, maybe as old as eight or nine, who don't have crayons or markers at home. If they don't have crayons or markers at home, that means they're not expressing themselves. That also means that they're not getting arts education in school. It's so important not only that we advocate for Prop 28 funds now that we have this historic win in California, but that we advocate for Prop 28 funds to be used. We need sustainable practices in dance, in arts education as a whole, all different types of programs. Not only do these programs help kids express themselves and their mental health, but they also help them in the long run academically. I've known that I can use both sides of my brain when I'm exposed to the arts. Had I not been exposed to the arts in my public school journey, I doubt I would be here today. I also doubt I would be able to cope with matters of life as well as I have. Arts are essential, and now is the time to step up. You can contact, if you're a community leader or community organizer like myself, you can contact your school districts via Create California's website and toolkit. You can also double check if you're a parent what your student school or your child's school is doing with those funds. Maybe that's a simple ask to the art teacher, if you have one, or the principal, letting them know that you want to know what their plans are for Prop 28. This is super open-ended and the time is now to act. You can always follow up on social media too and see what they're doing with art education. Other ways you can advocate is just making sure that people know why art education is important. People tend to think about it as, a, as something that's not essential, but in reality, it's a necessity and lifeline for students in California. Let's change the 11% of California public education school. Public education students who are receiving arts education to 100%. By that, you can just simply contact your school district and take a measurable step in ensuring Prop 28 funds are used correctly. Thank you so much and feel free to contact me or um, ask me any other questions regarding students playing a role in this and also community members playing a role in this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penelope, for that. Um, it's so great to learn about what our students are doing now and what our students can do in the future to advocate for arts education. So as we learned about Penelope's roles and what other students can do, what is your why for arts education and what do the arts mean to you? How have the arts changed your life or your student's life? Please share that in the chat as we continue on into our next section. So again, We'd love to hear about why arts education, why is it so important to you and to the people in your lives? Please go ahead and share in the chat. As you are all sharing your thoughts, um, transition over to Yamili from Arts for LA. Hi everyone, my name is Yamili, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm here to walk you through some of the resources that Create California has put together for us to use. Um, Katya, are you going to be sharing your screen now? Um, yes. Let me go ahead and go to our website. Okay. All right. So um, Create California has created a video, which we saw earlier, that is available for us to use. So if you're ever needing to pass on information, whether it be publicly or to peers, you can forward this video. There are additional tools that Create California has put together that you can find on this webpage, including a flyer for parents that Katia will get to, um, talking points, informational decks, and graphics. 
And again, these are all available for you to use if you are passing on information about Prop 28. It's all found here on this website. And I believe the link will be included in the chat as well for you to reference. I'm going to pass it now to Dominique, who's going to um, talk more about the topic. Thanks, Yamili. Hi, everyone. My name is Dominique Enriquez. I'm the executive director for the Arts Education Alliance of the Bay Area. And I'm gonna take a minute just to walk through the tools and resources that are provided in, um, in a little bit more depth. Sorry to make you go back and forth, Katya. <clears throat> so first, if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, um, well, I guess to speak on the page as a whole, uh, all of these resources have been put onto one page to make it quick and easy to access tools and resources as an advocate. You'll find these two ovals here towards the bottom of the page. Um, Katya, I'll have you clicked on the one to the left. The Find Your School Leaders tool allows you to simply enter your zip code. Um, you can use only your zip code if you prefer, or you can enter your address. And by doing so, the tool will identify your local school leaders um, and will... Um, I don't know if you can put in a zip code so that we can see. Beautiful. Thank you. It'll identify your local school leaders and will populate with an email template that basically advocates for the equitable implementation of Prop 28 funds and provides direct links to data and strategic planning tools for your local leaders. All you'll have to do is enter your name, your email address, and self-identify as an administrator, an educator, a parent, or simply a community member. And once you hit submit, it will send this off for you. <clears throat> if you feel so moved and wanna take your advocacy efforts to the next step, you'll find another tool on the right-hand side, which provide tips and tricks for presenting at a school board meeting. <clears throat> Here you'll find information about preparing for um, presenting at and following up at a board meeting, including talking points um, and recommendations for telling a personal story about arts education within your own community. And if you go back to the original page, You can scroll all the way to the bottom and find a handful of questions that you can ask your local principal. These questions just help to gain better understanding of where your school site is at in terms of their understanding of Prop 28 and any future or existing plans for implementation. Lastly on the page, what you'll find is access to all of the social media tools, including the video that we saw earlier, um, at the beginning of this webinar and images and copy for social media posts. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Ricky. Hi everyone, my name is Ricky Abelez. My pronouns are they, them. I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy with Arts for LA. And I just want us to take a few minutes to take action Advocacy matters um, and you being involved matters. Getting those you know involved also matters. So what we're gonna do first is take a minute to write down five people you think should know about these resources. Um, and we literally want you to come up with their names, their emails, and then reach out to them. Whether you reach out right now in these uh, one to two minutes we offer you or you reach out immediately following the meeting, we highly encourage it because knowledge is power. Um, so we're going to take those two minutes right now and make this list for ourselves, and I'll be joining you. All right. Hopefully y'all have a list for yourselves now. Um, if you didn't get to reach out to anyone in this moment, 
we again highly encourage you to do that following this meeting. The next step will be to send that letter that Dominique uh, so kindly walked you through. And so I'm going to go ahead and drop it in the chat. Uh, you'll again start by putting in your zip code and then enter your name and your email address and send that letter. There's nothing else you need to do. Um, it's been pre-written for you, but using your voice in this way does make a difference and local electeds love to hear from community members. So this is a way that you can take action. Let us know if you're having any trouble sending your letters, folks. Um, and if not, then we're gonna go ahead and hand it back to Adelaide and Create California so that they can continue the webinar for you all. Thanks for taking action. Thanks so much, Ricky. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Adelaide Kuhn, and I'm program director at Create California, pronouns she, her. Um, we, I'm happy to say we have a really nice amount of time to dive into some questions, just about a half an hour. We have a very robust list of questions that were submitted by you all um, with your registration. So we will move through, through those questions, but we also want to encourage you to put your questions in the chat because we'll make sure to sort of alternate and, and answer questions that are coming up for you in the moment. So to kick us off, um, Dominique, let's let's start with a question we have here for you. Uh, the question is, can you discuss ways arts organizations can support and partner with schools? Yeah, I think that's a really wonderful question and one that we discuss often um, at the Arts Ed Alliance. Um, what we're recommending is as districts and school sites are gaining better understanding of implementation and putting together strategic planning to begin the conversations with your school sites now, learn more about what the needs are and how best to partner with your school sites in the year and years to come. Um, that could be extending existing programming, making programming more sustainable, um, or even providing professional development in the future. Um, one of the things that exists here in the Bay Area is we have ongoing coalition meetings that happen um, throughout a number of diff different districts, connecting arts providers, teaching artists, um, district staff, and uh, local educators. So I say start conversations now since this is funding that will, um, that is here to stay. Thanks, Dominique. Okay, Allison, I have one for you. You mentioned this um, up top, but I know it's a, a question that's on everybody's mind. The question is, do we have a timeline yet? What can we do before funds are distributed to set the groundwork? So as I mentioned, we're anticipating the funds being released to school districts for them then to distribute to their principals in February of 2024. That, fund, that funding is available um, immediately when you are starting out your rest of your school year as well into the next couple of school years. Between now and then, I recommend that you approach your principal and your district folks if they have a strategic arts plan in place that you can review and read and see how that can be applied to the use of the Prop 28 funds. Getting to know your principal, getting to know the site council, the parent volunteers at your local school, as well as meeting in person or via email with the school board members to make them aware that you are interested and want to help with the, the funding being successfully implemented. Thanks, Allison. Yamili, I have a question I'm gonna send your way. What qualifies as the arts for Prop 28? Thanks, Adelaide. That's a great question. So Prop 28 outlines um, what it would consider arts education programming, and that includes but is not limited to instruction and training, supplies, materials, and arts educational partnership programs for instruction in the areas of dance, media arts, music, theater, and visual arts, including folk art, painting, sculpture, photography, and craft arts creative expressions, including graphic arts and design, computer coding, animation, 
music composition and ensembles and script writing, costume design, film, and video. Thanks, Yamili. Jessica, I am started, I'm tracking the chat a little bit. Is there anything you want to lift up from the chat, Jessica, or should I keep going? Um, yeah, I did see. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica. I'm from the California State PTA. Um, I'd like to lift up Bonnie's question from the chat. Um, and it looks like Allison might be able to speak to that. And um, just what is the funding formula for the schools that are under 500 students? Yeah, I can address that. So the under 500 students, 100% of it can be used for supplies, materials. You can check with your local arts education program providers and contract with them for artist in residence, assemblies. Um, and as, uh, as Yamali was explaining, all of those different categories um, are available and can be used for that funding. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. Penelope, I have a, a question for you. Um, how should PTA leaders be advocating for support for students to participate in new and increased arts activities? Having students at the table, maybe during these discussions, is a great way to start if they're high school or even elementary school students, if they feel comfortable. Um, another way is having um, a student leader maybe show their artwork or describe why the arts are important to them. Um, it can be much more impactful when the student's speaking directly to these decision makers and sharing why arts matters. Um, and it's always great if you have like a visual example of art or a dance or a song or something, um, or a photo of a play or something to describe um, what exactly the arts mean um, and how they're much more than simply just a hobby or um, something that's fun. Thanks, Penelope. I just want to lift up a clarification uh, from the chat. Thank you, Peggy, for clarifying. So just so we're all on the same page when we're saying LEA, that's a local educational agency. And so that's not a school site. An LEA is typically a district or a county office of education. So when we're talking about this, this 500 student threshold, it is a uh, it's LEAs, so districts that are uh, under 500 students, not school sites. Appreciate um, you putting that in the chat, Peggy. Thank you. That's a, an important distinction. All right. Here is another question for you, Dominique, if you don't mind. How can art museums get involved? Yeah, um, I think art museums and other uh, community art organizations and art centers can get involved in a number of ways. It's the same, it's kind of along the same lines as my answer earlier in that beginning the conversation with school sites now about what already exists and how those programs can be extended or made more sustainable in the future. Thinking more about um, what what outside of the box looks like in terms of professional development, ongoing partnership with classroom teachers. Um, these are all ways that arts partners can continue their involvement um, with schools. Thanks, Dominique. Uh, here's a good question. I'm, I'm eager to take this one. Uh, this question is, how do we best address the administrators and decision makers who still view the arts as fluff? Uh, this is a question that I think would, would fire up all of us here uh, on this meeting. Uh, and I want to share a couple of resources that include some really specific data to address this question. It's data showing that the arts, the benefits of arts education include higher attendance rates, um, lower dropout rates from schools, it, the arts increase parent engagement, community involvement in schools, um, uh, quality arts education decreases disciplinary problems, um, encourages positive student engagement and attitudes in the classroom. Uh, and it really just, the arts play a central and essential role in um, achieving the goals of, of Common Core as well. So I'm going to drop right now the document that includes that 
data and all of the the sources um, for the facts that I just shared. And that's where I personally would start. But I want to open it up to anyone else, um, any other partners to to speak about how they would address that question of arts education being fluff. Also, I'm just seeing a bunch of questions um, about the resources we're sharing today and the recording. I just want to assure everybody that there will be a, a uh, we, we have it in the works already, a follow-up email that includes the recording from today, the deck in English and Spanish, certainly the link to the website, um, many, all of the resources we're, we're sharing right now and um, additional resources as well. So we're planning to get that out to you Monday. Jessica, anything you want to lift up in the chat? Um, yeah, it looks like um, we have a question that um, Josiah, I think you can take. Um, can a school district take over current art programming um, that is being paid for by a PTA with Prop 28 funds? Sure. So um, talking about PTA funding, um, one of the things a lot of PTAs have done um, is because there was no funding is a lot of PTAs were doing fundraising through their membership, um, specifically to fund art programs. Um, that is to their prerogative and to their membership. Um, so yes, the, the answer to that question is yes, they can continue. They can actually use um, Prop 28 to um, either expand um, their arts and music programming, uh, make those programs more sustainable, um, or or anything else that they choose. Um, our directive is PTA is to um, is to ask that they uh, try and keep the programs that they're currently funding um, alive and active, and to use Prop Twenty Eight um, uh, funds to expand them and to make them more sustainable. Thanks, Josiah. Dominique, uh, there's a a question in the chat I'd love for you to speak to if you could. Will Prop 28 funds be available for schools interested in partnering with arts ed nonprofits that employ teaching artists? Yeah, our understanding so far is that the 19% allotted for every, you know, beyond um, a teacher in the classroom is open to supplies, the actual space, and this would also include arts partnership programming. Um, so this is where you would see some kind of residency work, that kind of professional development support, um, or any sort of extended relationship with a school site. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question that asks, what resources do we have if the administration has spent money in defiance of the supplement not supplant directive? Um, and I would say for now, it's it's a little hard to say because money hasn't actually been distributed yet, but we do, if you have concerns, we do want to hear about them and you can email us at prop28 at createca.org and we're happy to talk more about that. I just put that email address in the chat um, and I'll send it to you again, Jessica, to see if there's something you want to lift up. I have a question about, um, are the funds the same amount for all three years? And is it delivered in a lump sum um, that can be used over three years? Our understanding is that it will be an, an, an annual distribution of funds. And uh, the funds that a, uh, a district or a school site receives for one year can be used can be used for three years across three years it's not you know use it or lose it in one year it's use it or lose it across three years um, and like I said our understanding is it will be one annual distribution of the funds for that year
I see there's a question about after school programs and just want to clarify that the prop proposition 28 funds are intended to be used during the school day. We've covered a lot of questions. Anything partners that I'm missing from the chat that we want to answer? Thank you so much, Ricky, for, for putting answers in the chat and do a last call on questions before we move to share another follow-up event. Please don't hesitate to email us um, at, at that email address I just put in the chat, prop28 at createca.org. Happy to answer questions that come out uh, come up once you get off. Thank you, Allison. Okay, Josiah, I have a question for you. Um, this question said, is PTA advocated saying schools would take on programs, but they now they are saying that isn't new, so PTAs should continue. Was that gotcha. clear? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, no, 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 I think I understand um, what, what they're trying to share. Um, so PTAs um, in our state um, have the opportunity to pursue projects um, and causes based on their memberships and their membership consensus. Um, our direction um, as California State PTA um, is going to say to work with their school districts and their individual schools to use Prop 28 money um, to increase access um, to arts programming and to assist in making existing programming more sustainable. Um, so in short, do PTAs um, have to use um, all of their funds just for arts? Um, no, but our direction is um, go ahead and uh, try and make the programming that you're currently doing more sustainable with these new funds. Thank you, Josiah. Uh, Dominique, I have a question that I think you would be great at answering. Um, knowing that the funding is directly given to schools, can you discuss ways arts organizations can support and partner with schools? Yeah, one of the things that we're recommending here in the Bay is to be in ongoing communication with school sites. Um, as you're starting to hear, implementation isn't going to have a very quick turnaround, and so we've been in ongoing dialogue. We actually, here in the Bay Area, host a number of different coalition meetings in the San Francisco, West Contra Costa, and Oakland areas, and those serve as like a bridge between district staff, educators, local school sites, arts partners, and other arts providers. And what that does is we'll have this continuous dialogue so that as implementation and strategic planning continues to develop, we'll already be in conversation with one another. So whether or not that exists in your area, what we're recommending to arts partners is to really um, continue to invest in those conversations that you have at your existing school sites and learn more about what opportunities exist um, so that as planning continues to develop, arts partners community assets are all folded into what that planning looks like. I wanna answer a question that's coming up in the chat about whether the funding is going directly to schools and not to the district level. I just wanna clarify, um, the money will be going out in the February apportionment to the school districts which is the uh, local educational agency, sorry, local educational agency, the school district. Um, from the school district, the money will then um, be the allocation for each school um, will flow from the school district to the individual schools. Um, sorry if, if that was not clear um, earlier. I see that chat, that question coming up a couple of times. Um, great, okay, moving along. Um, Allison, I have another question for you. Um, my principal doesn't know how Prop 28 funds will be used. Um, he believes the district is deciding. Isn't this a school site decision? 
Yes, this is a school site decision. So the school principal, along with the teachers and the parents and any other care holders that are part of that individual school can decide what arts programs are being provided for both exposure and experience. So whether it's an arts partner from your local community or it's hiring uh, residential artists to come in or certified or classified teachers, it will be the individual school to decide that. I think the one the one thing I will add here is um, this is playing out a little bit differently in different school districts. Some school districts really are focused on collaborating across all school sites, and therefore the the decision making is happening more at a district level, especially in situations where uh, the individual schools are perhaps small, so small that they aren't going to be receiving enough funding to, for example, hire a full-time teacher. In that case, it's especially important to collaborate within a district to hire, for example, an itinerant teacher that can work across two or three school sites. So while the original intention was, yes, that all the decision-making would, would happen at the school site level, there are cases and a, a decent argument to make that there are advantages to coordinating at the district level and for school sites to be doing this planning process uh, yeah, that's together. especially Yeah, I think that's especially true of districts that have a VAPA director in place that are already working uh, in concert with the individual principals at their schools. And so they have a real good bead on what's available out there in terms of arts partners and um, how it aligns with the framework. So especially if they have a larger district with a VAPA director. Great. Okay, another question that was uh, submitted in advance, and Jessica, you can chime in here. I'm trying to keep up in the chat, but somewhat struggling to do so. So chime in, Jessica, if you want to lift up a question from the chat. Um, okay, question submitted beforehand. How can we use these funds this year before they're made available? Local organizations are reaching out to partner with our school. Um, and this was something that I think um, Tom clarified in the chat earlier, but I just want to mention again that this is really a question of your school district or school site's cash flow. Um, if your school district has a good cash reserve, it can begin spending the money now and then backfill the money once the prop Proposition 28 funds come in. So you may hear that the Prop 28 funds are already being implemented this school year. That's not because they've actually received the money yet. It's because your, your, um, your district is in a position that it can front some of that money knowing that this this these other funds are guaranteed later in the year, like we said in February. So that I just know has caused some a little bit of confusion um, in the field. So I wanted to, to clarify that. Um, Dominique, I have another question for you. Uh, how can art museums get involved? Um, so <clears throat> in the 80-19-1% split, that 19% is allocated for anything outside of direct costs for um, uh, uh, like art teacher staff. So that could include supplies, the actual room that's needed to facilitate arts learning, um, and also housed with an eligibility is arts partnership. Um, this is where uh, museums or other community organizations or partners would qualify for some of this Prop 28 funding. Since all of it is being sorted out, um, we've been in ongoing conversations with districts across the Bay Area and there's a shift in mindset in terms of a scarcity mindset and moving more into um, like an abundance mindset. So some districts are looking at what do community school models, what does arts learning and um, the extended school day look like? So I would encourage arts partners to start thinking beyond what already exists and you know that includes museums community organizations art centers etc um to think more about what could holistic arts programming look like within a school site in the before and after school spaces in terms of intergenerational programming and also in the professional development space
Thanks, Dominique. Ricky, do you want to hop in and, and answer this question um, that just came in in the chat for schools already funding arts programs? Can Prop 28 funds help replace that or supplement it? So the goal is that Prop 28 funds should always supplement and not replace. Um, th th this is part of the figuring out how we handle Prop 28 funds, but because we don't want it to supplant existing funding, the idea is that this will add on to the money that's already being put into a program. I hope that makes sense. Thanks, Ricky. All right. Um, 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 Dominique, I have one for you. What qualifications and credentials do teaching artists need to be hired by K-12 schools and community arts nonprofits? So there are a number of different entry points that a teaching artist can um, partner with a school site, whether <clears throat> they're coming in on uh, like say an internship, if they're already in some set, sort of certification program, if they're certified um, or they're coming in as a partner with a classroom teacher. So there are a lot of different options for teaching artists. It doesn't necessarily mean all teaching artists must get certified. Um, this also feeds into the conversation about comprehensive arts programming so that you know, some teaching artists may find that they do want to invest in a certification program and eventually become an art specialist at a school site. And some do want to continue in their practice as a teaching artist and partner with school sites, whether it be an in-school residency, an after-school program, or, you know, um, any other kind of arts partnership program. So I think that's the very long answer of there are multiple ways um, or credentials or certifications that qualify for working within a school. Thanks, Dominique. Um, I see a couple of questions coming up in the chat and that were submitted beforehand about uh, things like a waiver template, reporting template, uh, et cetera, just anticipating the need for these forms and wondering um, if when the California Department of Education will be releasing those. Um, and I just want everyone to know that in November, Create California um, in partnership with a number of organizations, um, but particularly the California County Superintendent's Arts Initiative, uh, will be releasing a toolkit that is offering templates uh, to a, a waiver template and a reporting template. We are working in partnership with the California Department of Education and sharing drafts, et cetera, but it will be released by Create California. Um, and right now it's looking like the timeline will be November. So once that is released, if you're signed up for our newsletter, you'll receive uh, an email with that toolkit. And as advocates, your role would be to make sure that your school leaders know about the toolkit and have the toolkit um, that they can use to, you know, pull out a template and apply for a waiver um, uh, that way. Yeah, great. Jessica, was there, I'm gonna pass it over to you if there were any questions you wanted to lift up. I saw this um, in the chat in advance and in advance of um, our webinar today, lots of questions about funding, um, PTAs covering funding. Um, we know that parent groups and PTAs often will cover um, what are considered extras, um, regardless of the fact that they shouldn't be extras, um, like arts education. And so I saw several questions um, about that. And this came up in my own, um, I'm also a parent leader and this came up in my own life. So we currently fundraise to cover um, a theater program during the school day. Um, so we kind of independently contract for a theater instructor. Um, and so, in the spirit of you know supplementing programs and expanding them, um, our solution at, at my children's school has been, well, we were able to offer a four series um, kind of introduction to theater during the school day. And now that we can anticipate these Prop 28 funds, 
instead of, you know, just saying, okay, let's continue the four, we want to expand it. So now the district is able to cover an eight session theater program. So it kind of takes the funding away from the burden of funding away from us because they're expanding it. So that would be um, kind of my recommendation going into how can we kind of lift the burden off of PTAs and parent groups, um, just see how they can expand. If you love your, you know, your VAPA program now, um, see what you can do to expand it and also pass the cost onto the Prop 28 funding. Anything else from the chat, Jessica, you wanted to lift up? Um, we did get the question of kind of what is a good approach um, or, you know, what can parents do on the parent level? Um, and I think a great opportunity is just attending your PTA meeting. Oftentimes your administrators, um, your principals will attend those meetings. And so during an open forum time, that's a great time to ask, do you have a plan? Um, because we've talked about, you know, how critical it is to have a strategic arts plan in schools. Um, so I asked my principal this and he was like, I don't know, we haven't heard anything. We don't, you know, he was just like totally lost. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so just kind of, you know, if you have um, coffee clutches with the principal or any opportunity to kind of have an open forum discussion with your principal um, from the parent standpoint, um, that's a really good opportunity to just bring up, hey, well, there's a lot of resources. Create California has a wonderful strategic planning guide, um, shows examples from other districts. Um, so it's just a, a great resource because sometimes administrators just simply don't have the same information across all districts. Thank you so much, Jessica. Hi, Maggie. Um, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yes, I just wanted to maybe have us like distinguish the difference between a PTA and a site council. Like your site council is an elected body of parents and community members that work in collaboration with um, with certificated members and classified members of your school site. And they are the ones that have the authority to approve something called the site plan, which later gets approved by your school board. PTAs are ind independent organizations of your school that have the ability to do fundraising and stuff like that, that your school site council does not have the ability to do. So just make sure that when we're using these terms, we're using them appropriately, like your PTA can advocate for things, but ultimately they do not have the authority that you would see at the site council level. Thank you, Maggie, I appreciate that clarification. All right, I think we'll take one or two more questions here. Um, let me see, Jessica, feel free to chime in. Uh, Dominique, I have this one for you. How can community arts organizations engage in conversations more closely with educators to help them and their goals? Um, <clears throat> sorry if I sound like a like a broken record, but I feel like um, looking for the opportunities for ongoing conversations at your district and school sites will be the most helpful. Um, even though if you know funding is not being rolled out until February and implementation may not happen until next school year. Um, being in the loop, one of the things we're finding across the region is that the district needs are so vastly different um, in each district. So being in the know and being in the loop now will help to um, be able to identify opportunities for partner partnership, identify gaps, um, and help to problem solve and be in community with your school sites and with your districts. As I mentioned before, we do have coalition meetings that happen across the Bay um, that are hosted by Arts Education Alliance. I know um, similar meetings happen um, across the whole state. So I'm, you know, our districts are very open. And so there are ways to find opportunities where there are ongoing meetings. I would say just starting to scratch the surface and being in conversation will be the most helpful. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, I just want everyone to know we are 
created, we have a huge list at Create California of all of these questions that are coming in. We're not able to answer all of them simply because we don't have the answers. We um, only the California Department of Education can answer some of these questions, uh, specifically the questions around what counts as baseline funding. In other words, how do you know what you're measuring an increase against? Um, that is a, a question that we, I mean, we can tell, I can tell you what I think, but that doesn't matter. Um, so we, do, we don't have that answer to that question, um, but we are in continual conversation with, the, with partners at the California Department of Education. And as soon as we have answers, we will make sure that everyone knows because it, it's definitely a key question. Great, okay. Thanks, Katya. You can go ahead and advance. And I think Allison, you'll share a little bit about an upcoming event. Yeah, so on October 12th at 3.30, we're doing a virtual Zoom workshop, Establish Relationships with School Leaders. And you'll be able to hear from Nancy Chairs Espinoza, who is the school board president at Elk Grove Unified School District in Sacramento, Denise Egan, who is the VAPA director at a large primarily Title I school district, Twin Rivers, and a principal from a local um, suburban elementary school. And they'll be here to answer questions and to help build a partnership with our participants in the workshop and how to work in concert with each of the decision-making levels in a school district to ensure proper use and success for Prop 28. So please join us on October 12th. It's a free virtual webinar at 3.30 and come ready with your questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Allison. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time and, and being here. Um, we, again, will send out all of these resources in our follow-up email. Um, really, really grateful to you all for, for stepping up to advocate in this very important moment for arts education in California.